this is the, the front line and it's Israelis dying right now. And this war will keep advancing. I mean, we are fighting this, this allied unholy alliance of China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, Hamas, and other affiliated terrorist organizations. And um, they hate the Jews, but they don't love Christians of the West. <laughs> they hate us as well. Yeah, I think that's fair. Um, and I think that's, to a certain extent, that that hasn't been... Obviously, you are in... I, I love the fact that Israelis refer to this part of the world as their neighborhood. So, I mean, Europe is a different neighborhood. We, we don't exactly... We're not surrounded by Egypt, Syria, Jordan, and, and Lebanon. But nonetheless, obviously, this region of the world hates you first, and they, they hate us second. After the Saturday people come the Sunday people, as the saying goes. Stefan Thompson, welcome to the podcast. Welcome to Invested. It's great to have you here. Thank you very much, Michael. Appreciate Before it. Before you started, tell everybody about who you are. I'm Stefan Thompson. I'm a Polish South African, but born in London, educated in French schools. I run a PR company in Poland, and I'm the founder of Visegrad 24, which is one of Europe's biggest social media news aggregators. And I'm here in Israel on the ground filming. Um, we just filmed an interview with you, Michael, which I'm very excited to release. And yeah, that's that's roughly it. And and so for a guy who grew up in South Africa, is Polish, went to French schools and grew up in England, why exactly did you come to Israel to uh, do media on what's going on here with the war? There, There is, um, I get asked this a lot by Israelis. There's an assumption, there's a suspicion almost of people who are non-Jewish who are supportive of Israel and of, of the Jewish people. There's a, an intrinsic suspicion. Why are you doing this? I'm not suspicious this of is, you This is not altruistic. There is a, there's a very definite self-interest here. I understand that Israel is part of the West. My fight, my struggle, my uh, my, my battle for Western civilization and our values uh, is also... Is, is also being fought here. This is an outpost of Western civilization. It's also um, the birthplace, of course, of Western civilization. Without Judaism, there is no Christianity. Without the birth, uh, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ here on the ground in Israel, there is no Christendom. And without Christendom, there is no West. Uh, this is an incredibly important place to the West. And I am very baffled, upset, confused, and, and shocked that so few people understand that this is not uh, this is not a fight for just Israel. This is not a fight for the Jewish people. This is a fight for all of us. And try to dig out for me. What are like your core values? The, the core things that motivate you? Because you set up quite the media empire in social media, but but it it feels to me like this is not just media for the sake of doing media. There's something deep down that drives you. Absolutely. I mean, we we started the, the the reason I started was the the messaging that was coming out of Central Eastern Europe, where I I, I moved back to I moved back three four generations after my my great grandfather was uh, stuck in stuck in London. He was the the ambassador to London before the war, and then couldn't go back because of communism. I, I came back three generations later uh, to Poland because I felt a deep connection to the country, and I was I was raised as a Pole. Uh, so there was a there was a lack of representation of the media that was that was coming out that was representing Poland in a, in a very negative light. And I, I wanted to address that, and I wanted to address the stories of, of Central and Eastern Europe and how it's being portrayed. Um, the, the, there was a, a hegemony of left-wing journalists who had access to Le Monde, to The Guardian, to The New York Times. They were writing these very negative stories about, about, about these countries, and I wanted to address that. That, that was the birthplace, really, of, of Visegrad and, and how it came about. Uh, and was an understanding that there is a, we have tools that allow us to bypass that traditional media, and and to really get the the, the stories of everyday people um, without having that that big entourage of, of what traditional media is um, or the or the barriers of it. But but the 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 aim it bec- it's become much bigger than that. It's become a platform in which I have been able to. I wouldn't want to overstate what I've achieved and done. But in but we have generated at this point in the last three months, it's over three and a half billion impressions on X alone. Over the course of the full scale Russian invasion of Ukraine, it's several billion impressions as well. We we we've been we've been essentially fighting back against Russian, Iranian, Chinese disinformation that is attacking the West. We have been promoting center, center right and, and conservative values. So an appreciation of what Western civilization is, a, a respect for our past, a respect for our history, a respect for our religions as well, which I think has disappeared um, to a great extent. 
um and and a respect for for the 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 values that have built the west into what it is and the west at it, at its core is the it's a pinnacle of of human achievement we have the, the the wealthiest societies in the history of the world the most equal societies in the history of the world we have the ability to generate wealth to generate capital to 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 pursue happiness uh, we have um uncountable freedoms and we have social mobility. This is an extraordinary time to be alive. And those things are all under under fundamental attack, under threat. And unlike Israelis and, and, and the Jewish diaspora who understands the fragility of life, there is a great understanding of the fragility of order in Israel. The Israelis, even the left-wing ones that I have spoken with, they have a deep understanding that all, everything that has been achieved, everything that has been built can collapse and it can go very, very fast. That knowledge that is so ingrained for many reasons in the Jewish people has disappeared in the West. And 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 that is what I'm that that is what I'm attempting to. I mean, it's a humongous task. I'm not saying I'm 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 a very, very small drop in a very large ocean. I have faith in you. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> I appreciate it. But let, let me back up for a second. Yeah, sure. I, I'm sitting here listening to you and wondering whether the fact that, so to speak, you were in the Polish diaspora during the time of communism or your grandfather uh -huh. was that that gives you the appreciation for how fragile this is. Now that Poland's kind of made a comeback from communism, sure. it is now a growing economy of Western values. Yeah. Uh, is that why you feel so fragile? Is that kind of the kinship Def moments? Definitely. And I, I'll say something that will make me both unpopular in Israel and both unpopular in Poland. We, we're very, very alike. Um, I do believe that there would be no Poland without without Jews and without the Jewish example. When we when Poland disappeared, there were three partitions in the, 19, in the 18th century um, and Poland didn't exist for 123 years. How do you maintain an identity without a state? This is obviously a question that the Jews have dealt with much, much longer than the Poles. And the Polish intelligentsia, the Polish elite during the 19th century, during those 123 years until the return and the recreation of the Polish state, based a lot of their thought and a lot of the organic work in maintaining the nation alive and Polish identity alive, whilst there were very severe attempts at Russification and Germanization of the Polish people throughout that 19th century, we're based on on the Jewish example. Um, we we are very alike, and, and obviously our, our histories have been the the history of the Polish state is very deeply intertwined with the history of a thousand years of Polish Jewish history. Um, so so there is there is I think a I, I think we we the Polish people have learned a lot from 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 the Jews. The Jews brought a huge amount of things to Poland. Um, and I, I I do also think that 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 yes there is the the poles as a people have been threatened and it's and it's been two hundred and fifty years of of tragedy for our people in the sense of no state World War One there's four million poles are killed fighting on all fronts because they were simply conscripted into the armies of the occupying empires of Poland then we have twenty brief years of building a state nineteen eighteen to nineteen thirty nine the tragedy of World War Two intelligence action abe action. Uh, where the Germans hunted down our elites and massacred them, not to the same extent as the Jewish people, of course, but but three million Polish Catholics were killed in six years. The Polish state was decimated, and they really came for the doctors, the lawyers, the accountants, the priests, the aristocracy, the landowners, um, the professors, the school teachers. These people were, were systematically wiped out. And then we have, obviously, this, the Soviet invasion that happened simultaneously with the Nazis. They come in on the 17th of September, 1939, and they come in with lists as well, and the the they they murdered two of my grandfather's brothers were were killed in the in the death pits of Katyn and Starobielsk, where twenty two thousand Polish intelli intellectuals and officers were murdered, and then we have forty five years of being under Moscow's boot, implemented by the Red Army. The Red Army is in Poland until nineteen ninety three, until December nineteen ninety three. No ability to create wealth, a system of repression, no freedoms, censorship, being cut off from the world. Um, and essentially state-mandated poverty. Um, so, so this is the, the Polish experience of the last 250 years. Again, I'm not, you know, you went through the Holocaust. Um, we, didn't, we didn't go through that. But, but as you can see, it's 250 years of being threatened as a people. And I, and I think that, um, that that certainly has formulated a deep patriotism in many Poles, a, a great respect for religion because the Catholic Church was an important player in keeping the Polish identity alive, and of and of Polish resistance, and of and of Polish, of of of, of Polish 
fight back against, especially communism. Um, but but that that threat has obviously disappeared. Even though, and and this is something that I worry about. I'm, I I live in Poland. I can see the a very rapid change happening, where we have had thirty years, twenty nine years of uninterrupted economic growth at an average rate of four point three percent of GDP per annum, between um, all the way up to COVID. COVID was the the first year that that we had a um, a, a slight recession. But there was uninterrupted economic growth, rapid explosion of wealth, the creation of a middle class, a creation of, an, of a wealthy upper middle class. The skyline of Warsaw is changing. And as these comforts have, have come in, so has a shift away from religion and, and so has a shift away from this sort of deep patriotism and love and respect of the past and tradition. And it's very interesting to see in, in Tel Aviv, which is such a liberal city, well, many of the people, and we have spoken to many people, we've done a lot of street interviews. So I've spoken to, I'd say, 150 people on the streets, it's just sort of everyday people in, in Tel Aviv. And many of them probably left-leaning, all of them with a deep understanding that you, even if you're not religious, you have to have a deep respect for your culture, your heritage, where you've come from. And a very interesting remark that I have about the the Israelis, they will use the, the Bible the, you will hear the Bible referenced every day. Yes. I mean, it is just... It's, part of the Hebrew language. Normal. Yeah, it's part yeah. of the Hebrew language. It really is. Yeah. Sorry, because I, I sort of rambled on. No, so my apologies. Yeah, one of the things that strikes me when, when you're talking, uh, you know, my family, uh, my personal family was in America before the Holocaust. Uh, my wife's family, not. Well, one of the things that I've found striking about uh, the whole current situation uh, and the war, just as it turns of history, is, you know, Israel's best friends in the world right now are uh, United States, obviously, but Germany, Austria, uh, Poland, uh, Greece, uh, you know, that whole kind of region, sure. e even Hungary to some extent, sure. which I don't think anyone would have imagined 85 years ago. Nay. It's a stunning turn of history right now. And uh, I'm not exactly sure what to make of it, but it's but I, but I find it fascinating. And I, I think a lot of what you're saying is true, which is... Um, there's a set of values that maybe had to do with the intertwined Jewish diaspora. Maybe it has to do with other traumas. Maybe it has to do with common enemies. I don't exactly know right now. Uh, but the world changes and alliances change in that way. It's it's been heartening on some you mm. know some level. I I do I do think that one of one of the one of my worries is that a lot of the framing of um, of Israelis of this this conflict and the reason perhaps that there hasn't been as much support as there ha that, as there should be is that. Israelis are, are very often speaking about this in terms of, of this conflict in terms of of anti-Semitism in terms of attack on just Israel, whereas it's so much broader that that actually there are. This is, I think, what Israel really needs to do is is to is to inform the Western world that that it is an intrinsic part of the Western world. It's an outpost of the Western world, and it's the battle line. It, this is this is the the front line. And it's Israelis dying right now, um, and this war will will keep advancing. I mean, we are fighting this this allied unholy alliance of China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, Hamas, and other affiliated terrorist organizations, and um, they hate they they hate the Jews, but they don't love Christians of the West. <laughs> they hate us as well. Yeah, I think that's fair, um, and I think that's. To a certain extent, that that hasn't been obviously. You are in. I, I love the fact that Israelis refer to this part of the world as their neighborhood. I've heard <laughs> that term so often. I don't know if it's a. If is there a Hebrew word for neighborhood, Michael? Is that where? Shkuna, shkuna. But that has, by the way, in slang, some negative connotations too. But yeah, um, yeah, we're in a different neighborhood, of course. I mean, Europe is a different neighborhood. Yes. We, we don't exactly. We're not surrounded by Egypt, Syria, Jordan, and and Lebanon. But um, but nonetheless, obviously, this region of the world hates you first, and they they hate us second. After the Saturday people come, the Sunday people, as the saying goes. The, I, I want to take you back to Ukraine. So you yeah. start the the war starts. Russia attacks Ukraine. Sure. Where does that find you, Stefan? And where does and what happens from there? We had a platform at that point. We we'd been building up Visegrad slowly but surely, presenting our perspective, countering this very left-leaning narrative that was coming out of Central and Eastern Europe and and presenting things the way that that, that 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 we saw them. And 
the full scale invasion of Ukraine, Russia has been an existential threat to to, to my region of the world um, for hundreds of years, for a thousand years. Yeah, for thousands. So, so we really understand that threat. You know, we we went through Russian occupation. We went through wars with Russia. Um, my family was murdered by the Russians, by the NKVD and Katyn Starobis, as I mentioned. Um, there is a, I have a profound understanding that, that this is a civilizational threat. This is a great threat. And we intrinsically knew we just, the, the, the people working on Visegrad, it was me, my brother, and uh, our friend Adam. We knew that we had a platform and we, we didn't hesitate. The moment the invasion happened, we were on it, um, writing about it, fighting Russian disinformation actively. And, and that was the, 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 the spurt, the growth spurt that, that took us to where we are roughly now. And, and obviously it made sense. Ukraine is our direct neighbor. So, so we immediately got involved in countering disinformation, helping all the initiatives that we could of, of bringing Ukrainian refugees. So there were, there were, we were connecting drivers from Warsaw, driving to the border to pick up refugees and put them up in their homes. The, the Poles opened up their homes. It was incredible. incredible. I mean, we had millions of refugees and not a single refugee camp. And, and that, I know it sounds like a slogan, but it really was the case. That, that magic is slightly gone. It's been almost two years now to the day. And um, it, obviously the situation is different, but, but Ukrainians were afforded all the same rights as Poles, all the same benefits as Poles. Um, the, 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 work, the, the, the workplace was opened up for them. And they, set, they went to work immediately. It was an incredible, it was an incredible time. Um, and um, there was obviously out of this great tragedy of the, the Russian aggression, there's a huge amount of good that came out of it, really. Um, now, it was a beautiful thing to witness. It was an extraordinary thing to witness. And I think it was the true essence of Christianity, of Poles. And, and bear in mind that we have a very difficult history with the Ukrainian people. There was a, in 1943, there was a, a, a terrible genocide that happened. Uh, about 250,000 Poles, um, some estimates go as far as far high as 400,000, were murdered in Volhynia and, and, and Eastern Galicia. And... Um, it was a very brutal, brutal genocide that, that, that was perpetrated by UPA, by Roman Trohevich and Stepan Bandera, people who still glorify to this day in Ukraine. And, um, and that was, and, and that it's an open wound. That, there's, that discussion is still ongoing. Um, the Ukrainians reference UPA because UPA also fought the Soviets very actively. Um, so it's a complicated history. There was that unfortunate event in the, in the, uh, in the Parliament of Canada, where where Yaroslav Hunko, who's being hunted by yep. Sim, the Simon Wiesenthal Center, was uh, applauded by the Canadian Parliament because he was a Ukrainian who fought against the Soviets, he, he, but he happened to fight in a German unit. Um, so, so there was an awkward situation with that. But, but, but that There's was a lot completely... of awkwardness in Canada in Canadian government these days. Correct. Is that fair? Yeah, but uh, but all in all, the, the the incredible essence of it was was that that was to me the essence of Christendom, the essence of Christian spirit and, and values to help your neighbor in need, to open your home up, to, to give shelter, to, 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 to feed the homeless, to house the homeless, um, and to give clothes to those without clothes. I mean, there's that saying in the Bible. In Isaiah. Yeah. 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 There we are. Well, why, why is uh, what you call the Western religion or Christianity so important to you, and why do you think it's so important to Poland? I'm a religious man. I grew up with a in a with a very religious mother. She's a practicing Catholic. She instilled things that I assumed were were completely natural to to everyone. It was a it was quite a discovery to discover that suddenly that actually not everyone goes to church every Sunday. I mean, it's, you know, as a child, you don't think about it, right? As I assume, as a religious Jew, you probably had the the same discovery. Oh, I, I grew up in Manhattan, so it was a little different. But yes. <laughs> Um, I mean, I grew up in a very, very secular, secular London. Yeah. Um, I went, I went to the French Lycée, which is broadly speaking, most most people were were not not Catholics in any way, shape, or form. But um, it, it was a very important part of growing up. It was, it, it's what what's formed a lot of my conservative beliefs. Have been formed by it. Um, and I, I, I do also think that it, it is a there's this there's a Felix Konecznik is a, a, a Polish, a Polish thinker and philosopher, described the West or what he called Latin civilization as built on on three hills: the Acropole, the Capitol, and Golgotha. So, um, Greek philosophy, Roman law, and, and Christianity. And I, th- I think it's a good definition of of what the West is. Though I think it ought to be expanded to 
to, to, to Judeo-Christian. There is no Christendom without Judaism. There is no Christianity without Jesus. We've asked around, uh, we've walked around the streets of Tel Aviv and, and Jerusalem and asked people, you know, there's two questions we do. Well, who's the most famous Israeli? That's a Gal Gadot or that's a Bibi or Golda Meir. And they'll say, who's the most famous Jew? And so, <laughs> amusingly, the answer is obviously, I mean, the most famous Jew ever is presumably Jesus Christ. People say Moses, they'll say Einstein, they'll say a few other things, but, uh, and then suddenly they'll click, oh, Jesus. <laughs> but, but obviously, right, there is. I mean, my, 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 the, my belief is that my God was a, was, was a, was a, a Jewish man. Um, and I, I think, by the way, that's become unpopular in social media. And all the kind of misinformation on social media. No, no, he's media. a Palestinian. Yeah, who is Jesus has become a, <laughs> he's a socialist, become controversial. refugee Palestinian. Yeah. No, he wasn't. But, um, yeah. um, look, the, the, the reason Christendom is so important to, to the West is that the, it has inspired our architecture, our art, our culture, and, and ultimately it has led the liberal values of the West today, the, the liberal in the classical sense of the word, have been formed by centuries of Christendom. That there is what we have today is um, it, it is an accumulated wealth that it didn't come overnight. It, well, it didn't all happen in the 20th century. It took, it took two millennia to achieve it. And it, and it took that, that torch. I mean, when Rome falls and Rome is sacked, and there's what, what, what is referred to as the Dark Ages that, that aren't as dark as people like to refer to them as. But, but there is that, that torch of Western civilization, of, of, Christi of Christian belief, of, of Roman law, of Greek philosophy is carried through in what is referred to often as the Benedict Option, where in these small towns and villages, small communities kept that light awake. And, and this is, I mean, there's the saying that, that says, you know, that the tradition is not the worship of, of ashes. Uh, it it is keeping keeping the flame alive, and and I, and I think there is no West without without Christianity. I think that without at least a respect for it and an understanding, I, I see I see something that uh, uh, that I don't know if you've seen this across the West. There are churches that are obviously empty; no one goes to them because of the secularization of society, and they're being turned into cafes and 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 libraries and even nightclubs in some cases. That is that to me is 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 a is a very powerful image as to what that there is a lack of appreciation for the the the, the sacred and the profane and 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 that there is a sort of profanity to turning a church into into a, a library i mean a library might be better than a nightclub or a cafe for sure but but it, nonetheless there is a sort of perverse transformation in that and i and i, I do wonder and actually this question for you do you think that if there was a synagogue here in Tel Aviv or in or in Jerusalem that wasn't being used, is that something that would be possible, conceivable here? I don't know. They seem to all be being taken over by small groups of people here in Tel Aviv. There are a bunch of empty synagogues in Tel Aviv, and now you find kind of small squatches, of... anarchist squats. Well, well, no, you know, <laughs> religious uh, squats have taken over the city. Uh, religious squats. Well, that's uh, but, a very uh, different story. Uh, but uh, you know it. Uh, it I've written this piece called uh, for for Fortune called Covenantal Capitalism, and I actually just wrote a longer piece on the topic uh, for this weekend. And uh, one of the things I, I argue is that capitalism actually can't exist without the underpinnings of community and taking care of the other. Absolutely, uh, that 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 has been such a part of the Judeo Christian ethic uh, because it creates a covenant uh, between me and you. Correct. That, that I that I want to empower you and that Adam Smith's capitalism actually people have forgotten grows on this Christian covenant that exists in Scotland and the UK it's a Protestant in that case uh, and that's been part of the explosion of prosperity once they put capitalism on top of this structure and it's not a statist infrastructure it's actually a religious communal yes. infrastructure that enabled capitalism to grow and innovation in my view 100% agree there's one, one of the, the sins that calls for the vengeance of the heavens is not paying your employee and I think it extends to not paying your employee fairly it's in the Hebrew Bible too, Surely. twice. The 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 fact that the fact and and this is the the brokenness of capitalism. I think there's genuine critiques of capitalism, and I and, and there's people on the left that 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 criticise it. I think in a in a very eloquent and 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 interesting way. What we're seeing now in the West, where you have you know sort of employees working for Amazon, working in the U.S., and they have to have two jobs. They can't they can't afford to have children. There is a brokenness to the system because there isn't. The, the, the capitalism detached from the safeguards of religion. There is a, a, an intrinsic safeguard to Judaism and to, to Christianity that, that, that 
keeps capitalism from becoming this this in essence a sort of monster that eats away at its own at its at at its own. Yeah, one of the fascinating stories from the war here mm. is about a guy named Harrell Friedman who has a jewelry store in Dizengoff Boulevard here in Tel Aviv. Mm. He went off to reserve duty for ninety days and basically couldn't make ends meet, etc. He announces that he's going to have a liquidation sale in his jewelry store and on Dizengoff. It gets to two journalists, and uh, and they they publish it, and all of Israel is turned up to buy this guy's stuff at a fair price, and he's staying open because of that. I Incredible. think that's part of like you know, incredible the, the communal infrastructure yeah. that's that that exists here. That New York's capitalism and that atomization in the West has occurred, I think, to a much greater degree than it has here. I agree with that. I, much that's what my piece is about degree. that I launched this weekend. Yeah, I'll send it to you. So I want to switch gears for a sure, second, of course, and go to you go to. Because actually, ironically, it's like connected. Like Elon Musk was yesterday in Auschwitz, in Auschwitz, in in Poland, and we've been talking about Poland. And he had this comment uh, um, about his aspirations and and what he's doing. But I, the interesting thing to me is you mentioned that you've really exploded on X sure. in in Visegrad, and there's been uh, a fair amount of criticism of Musk, um, uh, which I actually defended. It's probably the most viral tweet ever in Hebrew because uh, Musk right. Elon uh, retweeted my tweet. Uh, where I said, better an open air of ideas there than controlled media that has an agenda. It's not that people on social media don't have agendas, they do, but there's enough ideas out there yes. than the open market of ideas and with community notes that can kind of hold people accountable. This is a better architecture for the future of news. I'm interested in what you think about that. I, I, I agree with you. I think that, that you cannot have freedom of expression and freedom of speech without uncomfortable speech. I, I do also think there is an intrinsic date to, to defend that the mainstream's idea that that attempts to curtail what Elon Musk is trying to do, that there is an issue with the open air marketplace of ideas that it can be abused by bad actors. And we are we are under constant threat from a machine that is very powerful, very well organized and very well funded of of bots, of disinformation accounts, of influencers who are bought and paid for by Iran, China. Russia, but also the Qataris. So there is. We looked at this with the um, the NC, the NCRI. There was the study that 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 Visegrad helped and, and worked on, which showed that for every one pro-Israeli hashtag, be it "Bring Them Home" or "Free the Hostages" or "Stand with Israel," there were fifty-seven posts on this was on TikTok. Uh, fifty-seven posts with pro-Palestinian or pro-Hamas, uh, pro-Hamas. Uh, hashtags obviously there's there's two billion almost two billion muslims so it, it, there is a certain or, or, organicness to that but there is no doubt there is no doubt that there is a machine that is creating content that is creating influences that is funding influences that is mass posting we've seen this with ukraine where, where russian disinformation very powerful tool that has infiltrated mainstream media to a certain extent that had that had built its its architecture around russia today and, and we're seeing the same with the Qataris and they're doing it with Al Jazeera, for example. And yeah. it's an incredibly powerful tool because a lot of what they post is actually good journalism until you get to that part where they're, where they're kind of coming through that back door and they're saying, and here is some pro-Hamas content that's sort of hidden away in this, in this pile of decent content. Um, so, so in that sense, that the, the free marketplace of ideas is under attack because of those bad faith actors. And they needs then you have, that we have to build safeguards against them because we're seeing what has happened to Gen Z. The studies in the U.S. showed that 67 percent of Gen Zers it was actually exactly converse. Boomers were 67 percent pro-Israel, and Gen Z was 67 percent pro-Palestine. So you, you've reached a stage where 67 percent of Gen Zers in the U.S. are either either at least openly pro-Palestine, potentially. Openly pro Hamas. And so, by the way, significant percentage, significant percentage, not patriotic to America, and not patriotic to America. This yeah. is exact, and this is that that link of if they hate Israel, the odds are they also hate the West, and they blame it for every single evil in the world. So, but 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 absolutely, I I think what what Musk has done is a is a great. I mean, he's an incredible man. He's an incredible entrepreneur. He, he, I mean, what he has achieved in one lifetime, you know, millions of people could never achieve in in a, in a Thousands, thousands of lifetimes, but, and it's so many fields. And he has, he has, you know, he's bequeathed a great gift to all of us 
by by doing what he did with X, by ending the shadow banning process, by own uh, by ending arbitrary takedowns of accounts, by by reducing cancel culture, and um and and I think and I you know these accounts like Jackson Hinkle for example or or Salman Suyed, um as a few other sort of blatantly. I mean, blatant bad actors. Owned actors, probably. Owned actors. Probably. Most likely. Um, but but in fact, having that, that that there and being able to challenge it and being able to argue back and fight back and, and have that debate in open, I actually think is objectively a good thing for society and I think it's, it's, it's a good thing for free speech. I want to tease this open a bit because I think this is like the heart of a big conversation right now, which is you said you got started uh, because of Le Monde and The Guardian, sure. et cetera, which, which kind of projected a yeah. certain image, which we couldn't see what was behind or who was behind, uh -huh. um, but but certainly uh, caused a certain narrative to take to take hold. You also got started because of Russian disinformation, Absolutely. which, by the way, acts on both mainstream media and social media. We talked about this war with Hamas in which social media and mainstream media, whether it's, it's uh, Al Jazeera, as the case may be. Or BBC or the New York the Times. The BBC, Sky News. For sure. And uh, social media uh, accounts. And it feels like there isn't a perfect system, no. obviously. And I think that the question comes down to, or, or, or part of the question is, as we kind of project this forward and technology gets a lot better and AI gets a lot better mm. uh, in, in creating more and different and fake content and uh, some real content, what is the better architecture for media and for narratives, for you, for Visegrad, uh, for me, for for society, going forward. I I I think there is a great future for citizen journalism, where the the truth is not owned by anyone, and everyone is a journalist. There is a there is a great beauty to that, and there is a great fairness, and there's a there's there's a there's a there's almost a justice to it that there isn't someone who detains the keys to the truth and says i have you know the ability to to create write write up interpret and then distribute the the end of that is is a great thing and i i, I think and this is very much the project that visegrad 24 is here doing in israel on the ground we've gone around and and my team is right now in serona market filming this two crews with multiple presenters taking turns asking questions and and giving the mic to the people, um, and and saying you know, and it's a range of questions, and we're going to air all these different opinions. We want different opinions. We don't. I, I'm not. You know, Visegrad doesn't hold the the key to the truth. I don't know what the truth is. I'm, I'm trying to to get it. And obviously, the the, the truth depends on 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 who. Obviously, I mean that, that's a dangerous statement right there. It's a very postmodernist statement. I was about to say the truth depends on you know your. Well, I think you say there's a lot of perspectives. Sure, there's a lot of perspectives. That convince people of what their truth is because we all have some psychological sure. bias that we view Absolutely. the world. Uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. By the way, in the 19, in the late 90s, a journalist at the time for the San Jose Mercury News named Dan Gilmore wrote mm. a book called "We the Media" sure. about the future of citizen journalism. I actually think it's taken more than 20 additional years until almost everything he wrote came uh, true. Came true. Well, wow. uh, I think we're living in that era right now. But but like you look at Instagram, you mm -hmm. look at TikTok, yeah. and you look at X, right, or Twitter. Yeah. Uh, it was formerly called Twitter. And I ask you, what's the best architecture for the future of journalism and news and technology? Which of the three is it? I, I think I think it's I think it's all three. I mean, obviously, bear in mind that TikTok is a CCCP disinformation tool. Um, CCP, not CCCP. Um, it the is, CCCP it, was the Russian hockey team. It was yeah, yeah. It was a part of time. Yeah, it was in the Olympics. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Um, no, I mean it, it's it it is a communist tool. It is a psyop. It is designed uh, to demoralize the West, and it has demoralized the West to a great extent. But it is also a great platform for virality. It, it is. There are some subjects that have no censorship, where you, in, in the sense of um, th there's a lot of educational videos that we've done with Visegrad talking about just European matters that have done very well, that have reached Gen Z, that have reached audiences that we wouldn't reach in other places. Instagram, again, is is a place that is, a, it's an aesthetic space, so it reaches, again, a slightly different audience. Um, videos there perform fairly well. Again, you reach a, a Gen Z and millennial audience, so you, you reach people you wouldn't normally reach. Um, Facebook, you're reaching primarily uh, a slightly older demographic, so Gen X, and you're, you're, reaching, you're reaching boomers as well. Um, X is the place, it's, it's the cross-section 
of of thought leaders, of journalists, of politicians. X really is where news happens. It, it truly has become that space. Mainstream media gets its news off of X. Right. Because because we, we've reached a, a, an interesting point where actually if you have a big enough platform, a social media account that's big enough, you, you don't need to, if, if, if you're a prime minister's office, you don't need to call up the BBC and say, hey, I have something important to say. You, you just post the text. And uh, and the meat is going to have it, you know, any minute. They they will write up the article. Um, so I I think X is is the is the place where obviously the the masses. Um, I I don't like that word because you know people are people are people. But but the the in the in the colloquial sense of the word, the the masses aren't on X. X is a space of of um, opinion leadership. Of opinion leadership. Yeah, and that does get disseminated further. And Visa Go 24 is at a very interesting place where we have several hundred members of various European parliaments who follow us, about 150 ministers from 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 multiple countries, uh, several several current prime ministers. I think five sitting prime ministers follow Visa Go right now, and several thousand several thousand journalists from across Europe, the U.S., but also the Middle East. Now, many of them many of them are our detractors. Many of them don't don't like our content and disagree with it, but but we have reached an incredible place where we have been able to break multiple stories. Um, a recent one that we did was the balloons that were flown over JFK to disrupt air traffic. Unbelievable work you did there. Thank you. I appreciate it. And that, that, but that, was the, that is the essence of citizen journalism. A worker of the airport messaged us, said, I want you to break this story. I love your content. I love your work. An FBI investigation has now been launched into the people who... But why did mainstream media pick that up? Because they didn't... Even after you published it, it was barely visible in it, mainstream media. It, it was, I mean, it was a very uncomfortable thing having, I mean, essentially domestic terrorists. This is an act of domestic terrorism. 100%. To launch balloons over an airport. To, I mean, imagine if a plane had crashed because of it and they killed people. I, I mean, I think they'd probably celebrate. They'd, they'd think it's some great win for their cause. Yeah. But, um, but, but it was. No, so the, but the FBI did launch an investigation. And that was... That that to have that as a as as something under under my belt, I I am very proud of that. I think it's a great achievement. I think it was a great achievement. The fact that the man who filmed it trusted us enough with that story and and wanted us to break it, and and that's happening more and more. Um, there's people who 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 trust us. There's people who understand that we we we. I'm not I'm not impartial. I I am biased. I'm and I'm, and I'm biased because I opposed. I'm, I'm pro-Israeli because I oppose. Islamist fundamentalist terrorist organizations who want to wipe out the Jewish people and then Christians next. Um, that's not a radical position to hold. It's a sensible one to hold. <laughs> and, and, and people have, I would hope. we've had some great content being sent to us, some, some, and now we're making great original content. And my hope is that, that in, the, in the coming months and coming years, we will be able to scale this into, into a, 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 a more serious news outlet with a, with a bigger team and and I think that's very likely to happen. I, I think we've reached a, a point of momentum, a point of trust, a point where we have a proven audience. We're reaching a billion impressions a month consistently now uh, for multiple months. And and I and I think that that there will be people who believe in us sufficiently to 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 make it happen. What 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 would you do about all the fake that is on X or Instagram or TikTok? Like how do we handle that? I don't have an answer for you, Michael. That is a, a, a question for greater minds than mine. I I, I have I have no idea how you to worry deal about with AI. It. You worry I about do. AI in that context? I yes, very much so. I I, I obviously I, I my primary line of work was was has been PR for years. Um, it's been very interesting to watch uh, how fakes are disseminated in political campaigns, very strategically. You worked on a lot of political campaigns. I've worked on a lot say. of political yeah. campaigns. I've 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 seen. Fakes be deployed. It's very interesting to see how they how they are released and how they how they manipulate campaigns. And the thing is, they they happen faster. They're released faster than they can be counted. I, I don't I don't I don't know where the answer lies. I don't. It's a threat that is uh, that is beyond my comprehension and beyond. I I don't have an answer. If you're going to give one piece of advice to to Elon Musk on what to do with X, what would it be? The bots. <laughs> Which is part more of the actively. Fake. I am struggling with uh, with uh, with Iranian, Chinese, and Russian bots. We, if I posted something right now, it could be we could tweet hello right now, and within one second we'd have about twenty five comments saying "Free Palestine, 
some swear words about Visa. I mean, just just automated bots. Doesn't matter how many of them I block. It's always about twenty five of them within one second that come. That that's a that's an irritation, and I think there must be there must be a sensible way to clean that up. Perhaps by making everyone pay even a dollar, whatever it is. But that that is definitely an issue. Going back to kind of the impact of fake news on political campaigns. Yeah. So you've been involved in a number of political number. campaigns. Yes. I want to ask you if you publish fake information. I, 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 I'm sure you have. What do we do? Like, we're going to have an election in Israel soon. This year is going to be a U.S. election. Sure. There's an incredible amount of fake news. Using AI, for example, you know, you can make President Biden- Say anything. Say anything. Say By anything. the way, and, and, and it's worse, indistinguishable. It's reached the point- where it's almost indistinguishable from the real thing. Right. It's difficult to... I mean, I watched, did you watch Javi Mille's uh, speech at Davos? I did. Right, which was dubbed, I don't speak any Spanish, but it was dubbed and he saw his lip sync that he, as if he spoke in English yeah. in his own voice, his own yeah. accent. Yeah. It was incredible. It's incredible. And if I didn't know he didn't speak English or he speak English, well, I wouldn't you, know you'd that assumed, You would have insurance assumed, oh, Javi Mille is making a speech. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, by the way, I bet you I had a better experience than people in Davos who had to have it simultaneously translated by some talking head behind a booth. Yeah. Like, what do we do about that? Just think about the following circumstance. Somebody deep fakes Jerome Powell, the chair of the Fed, sure. saying, sure. I'm reducing interest rates, <laughs> you know, 100 basis points. You know, market takes off. Somebody makes it. Or I'm raising interest at 100 basis points. The market tanks. I got a big short and I'm... And I'm off to the races. Like, that what are you happened about when, when, right when, with the Bitcoin ETF. It, 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 well, that, that, that was that was hacked. I was yeah. going to mention something else. I was going to mention when uh, when when Elon Musk introduced the um, verified users. There were a few accounts that uh, that these guys they 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 basically renamed something, and they did crash some stock prices. <laughs> yeah. They tweeted out. I think one of them was a pharmaceutical company. I can't remember the exact story, but I think they were. They said, I think it was insulin. I think they said insulin would be free, and it came from an account that was verified, and the cr the price actually did crash. Um, you, you're asking again an incredibly complex question. I I don't I don't have the answer. I think the answer lies probably somewhere in in technical ability. To, I mean, in have I don't, I don't know in having. I was almost going to say something ridiculous, like saying you know it should all be on the blockchain. <laughs> the 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 Bitcoin bros will will say that you know the blockchain will solve absolutely every single problem in humanity. Um, my own framework for what it's worth is like. Yeah, you have two choices. Like we always trusted the called the New York Times had a brand sure. that was trustworthy. I'm not sure it's true anymore. Mm. Uh, and so, like our our trust sensors have kind of gone up on the New York Times. And so everything you look at on Instagram, Twitter, uh, uh, Facebook needs to be looked at with a high level of skepticism. And so, is that real? Oh, Mayor's community wrote that in the case of Twitter. We got to question that. And so. Everything over time might be perceived to be fake before it's proven real. Like one of the things I always do when I see something like Isn't that, that a good I, thing? I, I, I don't answer. Like I don't reply. I'm going to wait 24 hours to see if something sorts out here because it may not be real. But isn't that actually a good thing to have that assumption at all times? Uh, that might be a good thing for society. I think, yeah, schools ingrained... should teach critical thinking about facts uh, or about yeah. history or about all these things. I'm a big believer in that. We should teach critical thinking. Um, mm. It's one of the things you learn in Orthodox Jewish education is critical thinking on texts. But it, it's hard in the 24-7, every microsecond news cycle to go do that all the time. No, I, I, I agree. And and Community Nights actually has been a really interesting tool and interesting solution. Um, but but you, I, don't, I don't know to what extent you could do that on a YouTube video. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't know. The answer, again, is, is uh, yeah. So is fake news with us to probably stay for the rest of our lives? Feels that way. Yeah. I mean, also the the other thing is is that the 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 int news ultimately there's this belief that there is objective news. I don't I don't think that is true. I I think everyone has everyone is biased, um, and you you can take a story and if you you can frame that same story in in two ways that turn it into a completely different story. And we're seeing that happening in in real time, right? Mm -hmm. We're also seeing real time denial of of true events. So October seventh, the evidence is overwhelmed. I mean, th there is really no, there should be no question about the fact that it happened. There was a massacre; over a thousand people were killed. Um, innocent civilians were attacked. Three thousand Hamas fighters poured into Israel, committed 
horrific atrocities, documented them, live streamed most of it, and you're getting in real time. And and I'm not I'm not even talking about the Arab world. I'm talking about the Western world, where you you, you get people in the West saying, "Oh, it may have been AI. We don't really know what happened." It's not even they're not. It's not even them saying, "Oh." Um, this is a response to 70, 70 years of Israeli crimes on the Palestinian people. Blah, blah, blah. No, they're saying, oh, no, no, it didn't happen. In real time, I mean, and this isn't, there's that, that, that famous, you know, Eisenhower saying, please take photographs of, of evidence, because in 20 years, there's going to be people who, who are going to say it didn't happen. It, it's happening, you know, one month, two months, three months after the, the event and the overwhelming evidence. There's this incredible video yesterday of Noah Tishby. Mm. Uh, yeah, I watched it. In, in Utah, right? Yeah. Going around. And people don't know anything. And yeah. I, I sometimes wonder, you know, we have this narrative, it's called the Flynn effect, that, you know, I, IQs increase over the last decades. And I'm starting to wonder whether there's been a massive dumbing down of society due to social media. Or people are always just dumb. They just never got on camera. Have you what watched the, have you watched the idiocracy? No, what is that? Oh, you got to watch idiocracy, Michael. Idiocracy. One of the, one of the, it's a cult movie. It is an incredible film. It's the exact reverse of what you said. I never it's even a, heard of it. The The concept of the film is essentially all the clever people are, are too busy being clever to have children. They, they're considering it. They're thinking about it. They, they wonder if they can afford it financially. And all the idiots in the world are just procreating en masse. So the, the IQ drops dramatically. I mean, off a cliff. And there's two people with an IQ. I think I believe it's 100. So they, they take a, a soldier and they take a... A prostitute, and they they freeze them and get keep them in time, and they wake up, um, and they're the cleverest people in the world. And there's an incredible moment of them discovering this completely dumbed down society that tried to go back home in time. It's a wonderful film, and it, it's it's it answers a lot of your questions actually. It's it's an it's it's actually distressing. It's a, it's it's distressing. I I think these I people think are primed to believe fake news. I I do believe we're reaching a point where IQs have risen and they've risen for 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 many reasons, including simply diet, for example, and access to etc. 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 And average heights have gone up, for example, in the West. There's an incredible statistic in Poland where you have a certain decade where there was malnutrition because of communist mismanagement, and then there was another decade where the, the Polish government borrowed a stack of money and there were bananas in Poland. Um, there, there's even a a famous saying about bananas in Poland because that era was was it was such an important thing as shipping containers arrived with bananas in Poland. We couldn't have a. In, I mean, the the incredible fact that you know under a communist regime, the fact that bananas have been shipped to a country is, is a success. <laughs> it tells you everything you need to know about communism. But anyway, there's one decade where poles are on average shorter than they are in the next decade because of malnutrition. Which and you know the same thing happened with was with IQ. And I mean, I I do think that there are. Uh, we are reaching a point where cousin marriage, for example, in, in, in Gaza or the West Bank uh, is not exactly a, a good thing for the gene pool. Yeah. Um, it, it has real ramifications and serious consequences. Um, I don't know. I, I think we might be, I mean, I, I guess Stephen Haight and, and, and Stephen Pinker and others would, uh, Jonathan Haight would disagree on this, but um, I do think we're going to reach a, a period of dropping IQs again. Interesting. By the way, would you ban TikTok? In the West? Yes, I would. Um, and I, I say this as someone who, who does use it. Our Visa grad is on TikTok. We have hundreds of thousands of followers there. We've generated hundreds of millions of views. And we've done objectively good work there that I'm proud of. Work that, that has been educational, that has been quality, that has been using good vocabulary. I mean, even raising the, 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 the level. The level. Just yeah. raising the level of just providing content that is well-spoken, well-presented, um, that has some merit. That that in and of itself, in this in this absolute ocean of trash, of 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 vulgarity, of swear words, of of crassness, of of, of sexualization, of of just vulgarity. Yeah, that in in and of itself was a was a good thing. But I I would I I think it's a tool. I think it's a it's a very dangerous tool because it is so addictive. Because of the, it's been destroying attention spans. It context switches you. You're unable to focus. It sexualized young girls in a very meaningful way, as in the, these girls, I think that there's a process they go through where they, they post videos to TikTok, they get some views, and then they realize that slightly more sexual content, more sexualized content will give them even more views. So there's a dopamine hit. And the, the algorithm rewards them immediately. 
and and suddenly you have incredibly vulgar stuff. Um, and the the same with the crassness. You, you you do something stupid and crass and 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 silly. I don't know. There was a trend of people crawling around shopping malls um, as as if they were a sort of caterpillar. It was bizarre. Um, it was stupid and it wasn't funny and and it was a public nuisance. But it was generating millions of views. So suddenly you had you had idiots crawling around shopping malls uh, across Europe. Um, and then you had obviously the the letter to Bin Laden. How is it possible that in the span of two, three days, Osama bin Laden is rehabilitated in the mind of Gen Z? In two, three days, that that level of, of influence on on young people um, that is that is uh, that is manipulated. The algorithm is obviously manipulated. And then you see obviously the Chinese version, the Duyin version of TikTok, which is promoting an entirely different algorithm. Every seventh video is a video that is that is from the CCP. Um, it's an extraordinary fact that that actually they are making sure that their young people, even though that the, there is the context switch and there's the the dopamine rush of every new video you watch, and you always think the next one's going to be I'm just another one more, right? Right? And and they are promoting educational content that they're, they're promoting. So sitting at the poker table or the blackjack table, just one more hand, I'm going to win. Just one more hand, I'm going to win. Yeah, it's exactly that, and it really is. They've they, it's it's a beautifully designed tool. Yeah, it really is. Uh, I, Weapon. How it's would you feel? I'm just going back to fake media for a second. Sure. How, how would you feel if you kind of knew that the campaign for president of the United States was influenced by some fake item, or the prime minister of Poland was elected because of some massive fake campaign? Um, I know this kind of harkens back to our Russian propaganda, mm-hmm. but you don't even have to be that sophisticated. You don't have to be. You that know, sophisticated. it doesn't have to be a giant operation. A simple AI tool that you know propagates. Something fake about Biden, and he's not elected, or 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 the prime minister of Poland. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, I I think I think over over the course of multiple elections that that has been the case, right? I mean, there's the there's the 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 famous argument that that goes that those who watched, I, I believe it was uh, Kennedy was campaigning against uh, against Nixon at the time. Was it Nixon in the sixties? And those who those who listened to it on radio. Um, believe that Nixon had won the debate. Those who watched it on TV assumed that, that Kennedy had won, based on the aesthetics. And 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 those who were listening is an interesting distinction, right? Where you get, for example, on average, taller candidates perform better in elections than those who are those who are short. Uh, on average, you will not find bald heads of state. It's a rarity since the since the the TV world has become a thing, and we've had you know photography of everything and video footage of everything. Generally speaking, you do not get bald elected heads of state. It's just it's an interesting fact, right? I mean, but the bias is 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 massive where you reach that stage of of life that the voter is influenced by the fact whether or not the candidate has hair or not, or whether he's um or whether he's, you know, six foot one or whether he's five foot eight. It's a massive difference in so so if that if just that impacts an election, I think they have obviously in, in the past they've been impacted by by fake news, also by the fact that some things get unreported. I mean, that an element of fake news is news not getting reported. That's an important part of it, right? Sure. That that you don't hear something about a candidate because it's it's been made to disappear because the media collectively chooses to ignore it, or simply because it doesn't. It, it's not the story isn't broken. How do you choose what to ignore? Um, how do I choose what to ignore? Well, the the thing is, I I I'm at a at a place where Visegrad is a relatively small team of five six seven depending on how you count you know it's it's less than 10 people um uh any which way you count it is less than 10 um so so we're, we're limited in in that sense in having to cover specific topics at the moment i i would say that that 50 to 60 percent of what we are posting to social media is is related to israel mm-hmm. wow. and, and 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 the reason is we do not have the capacity to focus and to have you know, people who genuinely know about a topic covering that topic. The 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 Israeli topic, I believe, the team has been focused on this for several months. Um, is 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 well versed in the topic, and we have very good sources on the ground. I mean, we have people we trust. We have people who who send us things that we trust. We have an established network of people who are quasi contributors at this point, really. Um, but but we'd be incapable of. 
I, I don't know if if something major happened suddenly, it'd be very difficult to 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 cover both things at once. So so we're limited just by the virtue of of, and that actually solves the problem. But yeah, what not, yeah. What do I ignore? Well, I, I ignore, you know, the rest of world news because we're, we're busy on one topic and we can only meaningfully focus on one at a time. How do you see the rise of anti-Semitism affecting global politics? I, I think there's a genuine threat in the West because of mass migration, where you're seeing candidates like Jean-Luc Mélenchon in France and the rise of Jean-Luc Mélenchon, uh, a far-left candidate who is uh, openly anti-Semitic, and that is going to be replicated across across European states. There is going to be a normalization of anti-Semitism. Uh, we're already seeing it. And one of the reasons is the demographic change of the West is going to lead to that normalization because Arab populations, migrant populations, third, second generation, uh, third generation even, uh, will hold hold views, or not even, they, they already hold them, views that are anti-Semitic. So I think that will be normalization. Will, Fran- will France exist like we know it today in 50 years? France doesn't exist in the way I, I've lived in France um, in in the late nineties, early two thousands. As a child, I, I grew up in France mostly. France doesn't exist in that way already. Oh wow! I wasn't expecting that answer. Okay, what's the most important piece of technology for your business in the next five to ten years? That already exists. Yeah. What, what else? Oh, what else? Something that's coming up. I think the the tools offered up by AI that will help us edit. Editing tools, the, yeah. The, the editing process itself, and you know this because we, this is going to be edited by someone, yeah. is time-consuming. By the way, think, our, our normal editor is in reserve duty for the last 100 days, so it's been really tough. But yes, keep going. Yeah. That, that I mean, the ability to have, and, and some of it is already available. I mean, Descript, for example, which will do your subtitles for you, fairly accurately. You have to go through it, but it's fairly accurate. Um, the ability to dub things in different languages, we discussed this briefly. Um, but even the ability to, there's three cameras here. So there's there's a shot of the two of us, one of you, one of me. Even to have that, you know, the editing process of an editor has to sit usually and go, here's one cut, the, 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 and, and change from one camera to the other. That That's already happening as well, where you can almost semi-automate that. That's going to save thousands of hours of time. In a hundred years when they write the biography of S- Stefan. <laughs> they wait. Yeah. What's the title going to be? Man of the West. Man of the <laughs> That's like I hoped it if something You may more. need to move to Israel. <laughs> for that. I got one last question for you. In this era of fake news, if you had to bet on one person to solve it or the one place you'd have to go, is it TikTok, Zuckerberg, or Musk? One hundred percent. I mean, as it, it's a problem to solve? Yeah. Who's gonna solve the problem and where would you want to uh, go first? Oh, uh, I think it's Musk. I I'd I'll bait Zuckerberg has been becoming more conservative, generally more conservative as he's been, as Facebook has become a publisher in in the sense of it is also a platform people publish news. He's found himself at war with establishment media. It's a, it's a, it's an interesting shift that he's had. Um, I think Zuckerberg is a very interesting man as well. I, I think he's a, he's, he's a, he's an incredible human being. I mean, he's achieved incredible things at an incredibly young age. If you had to be left with one social media platform, would it be X? X. X, without a doubt. Yeah, without a doubt. All right. Stefan, thank you for coming. Michael, thank you. You can learn more about Stefan on X, formerly Twitter, at Stefan Thompson. That's S T E F A N T O M P S O N. You can also follow him on YouTube, TikTok, and Facebook. And if you haven't yet checked out Visegrad, that's V I S E G R A D 24 on Twitter. You should definitely go do that. It's some of the highest quality content out there, and they Thanks, actually Michael. break real news. Thanks Thank you, Stefan, for coming. Thanks for spending time in Israel. Thank you.